Hello! Today it's all about body language. But, but, didn't you say last week that we were to talk about master suppression techniques? Yes, I did. And we are going to talk about master suppression techniques because that is all about body language. <laughs> is a Norwegian lady who, among other things, was a politician and a professor of social psychology. Difficult word to say. It was in the political world where she, in the late 60s and in the 70s, discovered that she, as a woman, didn't get listened to the same way as the male majority was. She could have been talking to people outside the council room in preparation for the meeting, and there seemed to have a massive support for her cause, whatever her cause was. And then, when it came to voting, she lost. She also noticed that she wasn't the only one experiencing this. All women of the council, no matter what political view they represented, felt this. So she moved her chair back a bit, just so that she could see what the other members of the council did while she was talking. And what she saw explained it all. After studying the phenomena for a couple of months, she had defined five different strategies that were commonly used. It wasn't Beirut Ors herself who named it the master suppression techniques, or Heske technique, as it's called in Norwegian. It was the psychologist and philosopher Ingjald Nissen, who coined the term in his book The Dictatorship of the Psychopaths, where he tried to explain how the Nazis of the 20s and the 30s could climb to the amount of power that they eventually got. Birit Ors noticed that Ingjald Nissen's master suppression techniques were commonly used by men to diminish women. Mostly, this of course wasn't a conscious choice these men did. They simply were part of a culture where women was thought of as less competent and less suited for decision-making. Nissen identified nine different techniques, but Birit was boiled it down to five, with two extra added decades later. I will here concentrate on the original five. One, making invisible. This is to silence or marginalize a person by ignoring them. They can, for instance, cut in or start speaking even though it's your turn to speak. It can be another speaker taking something you said as if it was an idea of their own. I hate it when that happened. You know, you get just like, I just said that! Or when you speak, people start to talk to each other, browse their papers, check their calendars, or even get up to get a cup of coffee or something like that. Number two, ridicule. To make the argument you are making, or you yourself for that matter, look ridiculous. Imagine wanting to tell me something important and I'm just like, hmm, hmm, uh, uh, excuse me, excuse me, um, it's your accent. You, so, you so remind me of that, you know, that character from the TV show? Well, you know, it's so funny. Uh, sorry, I just wanted to say that. <laughs> Or, if you're making an accusation of wrongdoing against someone, you are told that you look cute when you are angry. History is full of examples of ridicule of women who just took a bit more public space than what's custom. Take a look at these pictures from the era of suffragists, for instance.
The pictures often are about women being portrayed as more manly than usual or about being portrayed as ugly or plain. And that, of course, is something that no woman would want since her looks is all she has. Three, withhold information. For example, if your colleagues are having a meeting that concerns you without inviting you, or when decisions are being made without everybody being present, at a dinner party where only some of the attendants have been invited, at the lunch break, or even in the bathroom. When excluding a person this way, you make them less able to make an informed decision and less able to argue for their cause. Four, double bind. Damned if you do and damned if you don't. You just can't win whatever you do. For example, when you do your tasks thoroughly, you receive complaints for being too slow. When you do them efficiently, you're being critiqued on being too sloppy. Or when you choose to stay at home with your children instead of attending a late meeting, then you are being blamed for not taking your job seriously. But if you were to attend the meeting, you would hear that you were not a good parent. Damned if you do, and damned if you don't. 5. Heap blame, or put to shame. This is to embarrass someone or to insinuate that they themselves are to blame for their position. When you inform your manager that you are being sexually harassed at work, but you are being told that this must be your own fault since you dress so provocatively, or when no one told you there was a meeting, they say that you yourself should have asked for it, even if there were no indication that a meeting was even needed. These are the five techniques that Birit Oz articulated in the 70s. The two she later added is the objectification, difficult word again, the objectification of women and force or threat of physical violence. What she discovered in this was that the existing patriarchal structures had its tools. And when she used these tools back at the men of her political assembly, she started winning the arguments. She has said that she felt terribly rude for using them, though. Because when a woman starts behaving like a man, she is seen as a bitch or a crone or something equally unflattering. In Scandinavia, discussions on master suppression techniques are very prominent in both scholar and public debate. It's also used in other structures than male-female dynamics. It's all about one dominant group using social manipulation to maintain a position in the hierarchy. Today, Berit Oz is 84 years old, going on 85, and still fighting for what she believes is right. There are quite a lot of videos of her talking both about master suppression techniques and on other issues here on YouTube. I'll just put links to some of them in the description box. I hope you learned something new today. See you soon, I hope. Bye! <laughs>